Hello and welcome to another message from the Venice Church of Christ. We're Disciples Making Disciples in Los Angeles. I'm Ethan and I'd like to thank you for spending time with us as we continue to explore what God has made known in Scripture. We hope that you are encouraged and edified by your time together with us. And today, I'd like to consider some important questions and would love to know what you think about them. Why would God provide prophecy through Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist? And why would Zechariah make this prophecy? as if it's already been fulfilled. So again, love to hear what you think. Why would God speak through the father of John the Baptist? And why is his message being communicated as if it's already taken place? We ask these questions because today we're going to consider what Luke has made known to us in Luke chapter one, beginning in verse 67. And his father, John the Baptist's father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people, and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers, and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us, that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Now, Zechariah is prophesying this, Luke tells us, in chapter 1 and verse 5, in the days of Herod, king of Judea. So we think that this is happening in the very waning days of the reign of Herod, somewhere between 6 and 4 BC is when we think Jesus is born. So John will be born a few months before that, and these events begin a few months before that. Uh, no, no, it's not exactly the year one. The guy who made the calculations was off a little bit. Uh, based on all the evidence we have, Herod would have died somewhere around four. So that's why we suggest this time period. Now, Herod, Herod has a father named Antipater. And Antipater is the reason why Herod is where he is. Antipater was a very smart man, was able to get himself well established in the house of the Hasmoneans, uh, the Jewish ruling dynasty who from about 167 to 63 in various ways and times in various uh, forms uh, had some kind of independence uh, for a Jewish state there, the last independent Jewish state that would exist until modern times. And in the year 63 BC, a couple of the brothers uh, in that dynasty were fighting each other and they brought the Roman general Pompey into it. And the, Pompey besieged Jerusalem uh, took it over, installed one of those brothers, Hyrcanus II, on the throne, uh, entered the most holy place, defiled the sanctuary. Uh, and from there on out, Israel was made part of the Roman Empire. Hyrcanus was guided and aided in his rule by Antipater. And Antipater provided a model servant for the Romans. And Antipater established himself and then established his son Herod uh, to serve the Romans well. And they're both Edomites, they're Idumeans. They practice a Jewish religion, but they're not seen by the Jewish people as fully Jewish. And Josephus, in his Antiquities of the Jews, tells us a lot about the barbarism, about the cruelty, about the excess and the paranoia of Herod. And it was well known to all who would have heard uh, Luke's story at the beginning. Um, the, he was very famous for all of his grandiose expenditures, all the buildings he built, especially, of course, that temple there in Jerusalem, which would be called the Herodian Temple uh, because of the excess of the grandeur of it all and the work done in renovation. But the people were just oppressed with the taxes. All that largesse came because he was taxing the people heavily. They did not like him. They did not like the Romans he stood for. They did not like any of this. And within living memory, uh, some of the older people among them uh, their parent, uh, some of the people's parents or grandparents uh, had lived in the days when Israel maintained its own independence 
And so there was that living memory of independence. And yet now, yet again, Israel found itself under the oppression of a pagan, uh, arrogant empire, this time the Romans. And it's at this time, we're told, that we meet Zechariah. And Zechariah, in verse 5, is a priest. He's of the division of Abijah, and his wife is among the daughters of Aaron. Her name is Elizabeth. And we're told that they are righteous before God, they walk blamelessly before him, they serve him, but Elizabeth is barren, and they are older, they are advanced in years. Zechariah is in the temple, doing his duty, and he is offering incense, and the angel Gabriel visits him. And the angel tells him that his prayers have been heard before God, and that Elizabeth would bear him a son, and he would call his name John. And that he would have joy and gladness. Many would rejoice at his birth. That he would not drink wine or strong drinks because he would be filled with the Holy Spirit from, his womb, from the womb. And he would turn the, many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He would go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Zechariah would have known what this meant. That if he's filled the Holy Spirit, he is a prophet. That if he is not to drink strong drink, he is going to be like a Nazarite, dedicated to God. He would have known the prophecies. That there would be the one who would prepare the way of the Lord. The one coming in the spirit of Elijah. Uh, from uh, Isaiah 40 and in Malachi. The uh, one who would turn the hearts of the children to the fathers and the fathers to the children. But Zechariah doesn't know how this is going to happen because he is old and so is his wife. And because of that, the angel says, you will be Mute. You will not speak until all these things happen because you did not believe. Uh, but it would certainly come to pass. That same angel would then, a few months later, visit a peasant girl of, named Mary in Nazareth of Galilee, who was a kinswoman of Elizabeth, a relative somehow. And he greets Mary as the favored one of God and tells Mary that the Spirit would come upon her and that she would give birth to a son. And she would call his name Jesus, Yehoshua, Yahweh saves. He would be called Great, and the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God would give to him the throne of his father David. He would reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there would be no end. In verses 31 through 33. And Mary would have known what that meant. This is the Christ, the King, the promised one of Isaiah and many other prophets. The one herald is Son of God in Psalm 2. And she's also confused, but she maintains faith. She's just confused how this happened because she uh, is not married. She's betrothed. She's a virgin. And the Spirit would come upon her, angel uh, said. And as an assurance, he said that Elizabeth, your kinswoman, who was of age, is now six months pregnant. That nothing is impossible with God. So Mary, having heard this, immediately goes and visits Elizabeth. And we're told that when Elizabeth hears the greeting, John leaps in her womb. And she's filled with the Holy Spirit and she cries out, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Why is it granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Uh, that, the womb, that the baby leapt for room, uh, in her womb of joy when her greeting came to the ears of Elizabeth. And blessed is she who believed there will be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And then Mary cries out in song, the Magnificat where she blesses God and thanks God for having raised up her station. And she could see the grand reversal going on, that the mighty would be torn down, the, lo the lowly would be lifted up, and God was fulfilling the promises that he had made to their ancestors to help Israel in a time of distress. Mary would remain for three months, whether just before or just after the birth of John is not stated, and then she would return back to uh, Nazareth. But then uh, John is born, and we're told that on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child and to name him, and they were going to name him Zechariah after his father. And she said, no, 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 his name will be John, Yohanan. And they're confused. The, the people around, because there's no one named John in your family. And so they're making signs to Zechariah about what should happen here. And he asked for a tablet and he wrote on it, his name is John. And everybody wondered. And then his mouth was opened. 
and his tongue loosed, and he spoke, and he blessed God. And fear came upon everybody who heard about these things, and throughout the whole country of Judea. And they were wondering what was going to happen with this child, because it was clear that the Lord was with him. And now Zechariah raises up his voice, fill the Holy Spirit to prophesy. And he speaks. And so what is going on here? Well, in verse, uh, we call this the Benedictus sometimes, because in Latin, the first word of blessed, uh, the, the noun form is Benedictus. And so we have uh, that blessing there. And you'd think, hey, it's Zechariah. And his son is John. His son John's just been born. He's going to spend a lot of time talking about John. Right? Well, when we get to verses uh, 68 through 75, he doesn't talk about John. He's talking about somebody else. So who is he talking about? Well, he is blessing the Lord God of Israel because he has visited and redeemed his people to raise up a horn of salvation in the house of David, just as had been promised by the holy prophets uh, that they will be saved from their enemy and from the hand of those who hated them. And you read that, and you read the past tense there, and you're thinking, is Zechariah blessing God because of all of the past deliverances? The deliverance from the Egyptians, the deliverances in the days of the judges, uh, in the days of the kings, in the days of the exile. And yet he speaks of a horn of salvation in the house of David, as he spoke from the prophets of old. The prophets did not speak of David, really, except for Samuel who anointed him. The horn of salvation is this uh, metaphor for power and strength, uh, is what the horn is. And the horn of salvation is power used to deliver, like in 2 Samuel 22, 3, Psalm 75, and it often of God for his, of his people. And so this is how God is going to rescue his people through this horn of salvation in the house of David, spoken of by the prophets. This is not about what happened in the past. It's what God is going to accomplish through the Christ child. But it's spoken of as if it's already happened. And we're going to talk more about that. This is a prophetic past tense where events that are in the future are being described as if they're already past in terms of expected prophetic fulfillment. And so uh, this way that he talks about Jesus here, very consistent with uh, what we see in Isaiah and in the prophets. And in fact, the whole message would fit very neatly into the prophets. Uh, this blessing of God because of the uh, salvation deliverance that God is providing. Uh, it's consistent with the message of hope in Ezekiel, the message of hope in Isaiah, the very brief message of hope in Jeremiah, and in other prophets. So uh, what is God doing here? How is God saving them from their enemies and from the hand of those who hate them? He's showing mercy. When we see mercy, we should be thinking of that Hebrew word chesed, where covenant loyalty meets steadfast love, where a person is very attached to some, is very a, a loyal to somebody, is very committed to somebody with warm feelings, uh, a word we can't translate very well in English. So that's why you get steadfast love, loving kindness, covenant loyalty. A very important message throughout the Old Testament. God is loyal to covenant. God is faithful to his people and to his promises. And so he's remembering that covenant. He's remembering the promises, the oath sworn to Abraham and to their ancestors that they would be delivered from the hand of their enemies to serve him without fear in righteousness and holiness in all our days. So Zechariah is prophesying for peace and security for the people of God and the Christ. Now, how did Zechariah might imagine this would look? We're not sure. Throughout most of the uh, covenant between God and Israel, that would look like a man living under his own fig tree and eating from his own crops and vineyard, seeing his children to the third generation uh, and have peace and security throughout his days and all of his enemies defeated. And so it wouldn't be surprising at all if that's the way Zechariah looked at all of this uh, and maybe what he was expecting. Now, how it actually turned out would be different. We're going to talk about how it actually gets realized. But even if it's not exactly the way Zechariah expected it, God is still faithful. And God is fulfilling the words he is speaking through the mouth of Zechariah, even if Zechariah doesn't fully understand. And he most certainly has remembered his most holy covenant that he made with Abraham and with Isaac and with Jacob uh, to 
and it's given to those who follow the Christ to serve him without fear because the enemy of all people, the Christ, is defeated in Colossians 2.15 and in Revelation 13-20. through 20. And that indeed those who uh, would serve a God in the Christ would be able to do so in holiness and righteousness and to do so in ways beyond anything Zechariah could have imagined, as you can see illustrated very vividly in the Hebrew letter. So God is faithful. He expressed covenant loyalty and he fulfills the promises that he made to Abraham and to Israel in the Christ. You know, that in the seed of Abraham, all the nations of earth will be blessed. Back in Genesis chapter 22. All the promises made through Isaiah, the promise given even to David himself in 2 Samuel and illustrated in the Psalms. God is being faithful to all of these promises and it's being realized in the child in Mary's womb. Now, Zechariah in verses 7, 6, and 79 turns to actually speak of his son. So he does actually talk about John here. And he calls him and says he would be called the prophet of the Most High. That he would go before the Lord to prepare his ways. Quoting Isaiah 40 in verse 3. To give knowledge of salvation to his people and the forgiveness of their sins. This is very important here. Now, the forgiveness of sins in the Old Covenant would only be associated with the sacrifice in the temple cult that you would go and have your sins are given by offering the animals. And, and Zechariah is certainly part of all that and not denying any of that. But what Zechariah is seeing here, and maybe not fully understanding, something that we will certainly see in John in chapter 3. Second Temple Judaism was no stranger to ritual washings. Uh, we know this because archaeologically, everywhere you look in, in Judea in the first century uh, uh, ruins, you find mikvahot, or uh, mikvah is a place where they would do the ritual washings. Uh, a little area where they would have living water, a water from a stream that's pouring down, that would um, be used for the lustration to cleanse from the impurity. So you know you're supposed to cleanse yourself if you've come into contact with defiling things, that kind of thing. Uh, there's all kinds of places in Israel around that, but you don't see anywhere in the law a provision for a baptism, an immersion for repentance, or an immersion for the remission of sin. But that's what John proclaims. John is proclaiming this as a prophet. It is a message that God has delivered through John to prepare that way of the Lord. And of course, who is the Lord? Uh, we are used to that term, kurios Lord, uh, referring to Jesus, and it certainly does refer to Jesus. Um, but there's always that valence of Lord as kind of the way that a lot of the Israelites used to describe the divine name. And so that's why it's not just the child who is the son of man, he's also the son of God. And again, whether Zechariah fully understand that in his prophecy as he's quoting from Isaiah. And by the way, speaking of the prophets and of Isaiah, you can see that Zechariah is no Sadducee, or if he is a Sadducee, he's a very bad one, because he's fully affirmed, and not just Torah, but also the prophets. Uh, something that would be more consistent with the Pharisees or someone else like that. Uh, regardless, Zechariah fully believes in everything that God has said, and he's quoting here and sees the fulfillment in John and also, of course, in Jesus, the one who uh, the, the John's preparing the way for. And in Christ, we are baptized to receive the forgiveness of sins in the name of Jesus. And John prepares the way for that by offering that baptism uh, of repentance and immersion and for remission of sins there in uh, the days that he prophesied and he preached. And Zechariah foresees this. It's very important. God doesn't do anything without telling it through the mouth of his prophets. And so he's saying that this is what John's going to be all about here, uh, to give knowledge, salvation, and forgiveness of their sins. And this is being given because, again, the tender mercy of our God, that chesed, that the sunrise or the morning star would dawn, visit us from on high, giving light to those who sit in darkness, and in the shadow of death to guide the feet in the way of peace. Um, a lot of people hear that word dawn or the morning star, Lucifer, think the evil one. But there's no association in scripture there. Uh, Isaiah 14, probably much more about Nebuchadnezzar and it's sarcastic and ironic. Uh, but we do see in Revelation chapter 2, uh, in verse 28, that Jesus will give the morning star. And in chapter 22 and verse 16 of Revelation, that Jesus is the morning star. And so John is heralding the, the dawn, the coming of light. And in John 1, Jesus is the light. And he comes into the darkness. The darkness did not comprehend it. But the darkness does not swallow up the light. The light is proclaimed to all who are there in darkness. 
And so we can see there that, that Venus star, there, the dawn is our, you know, the darkest moment is right before dawn, right? And so that, that Venus rising in the morning tells you that dawn is near. And so in that way, John is preparing the way that the light of the fulfillment of all God has promised is coming. You've been in darkness. It's evoking Isaiah 9, deliberately so. That there's been this darkness. You've been oppressed. You've wondered where the fulfillment of the promise is. Well, the dawn is here. The light is coming. It's coming. You don't have to wait much longer for the fulfillment of all these things. And that light will now lead, be able to lead people out of the darkness to guiding in that way of peace. Peace again being affirmed. Jesus is to be the peace, Prince of Peace, of course, in, in Isaiah's f uh, prophecies. And he certainly is the Prince of Peace, although it's not the peace that you would receive from the world. And so in this way, Je Zechariah is prophesying of John and the Christ. So what are we supposed to take from this? It's very important for us to see that yet again, just as with Mary's song of the Magnificat, so with Zechariah's prophecy in Luke chapter 1, verses 68 through 79, that Luke is continuing the drama. That of all the narratives here, this is very long and drawn out. This is the longest chapter in the New Testament, by the way. And it's the longest in the New Testament because there's this, this great drama that is being set forth for us. And it's the most Old Testament -y passage that we've seen, right? Uh... Gabriel is quoting Old Testament scriptures as if what used to be far in the past is now coming much closer. Um, we see Mary singing out in a psalm. We see people being filled with the Holy Spirit and speaking again. And now at the very end we have this prophetic message, which sounds very much like the message of the prophets. It would be very much at home if it were just a few pages earlier at the end of the Old Testament. It's got this Old testament -y feel. And so Luke is doing this deliberately. You could sure argue that, well, he just interviewed these people and that's why he put it in there. But even that wouldn't really explain why he's speaking of this and writing of it as if he's just continuing on with the historical narrative of Israel. You know, uh, you read the way that the kings tell stories and Luke tells stories in very similar ways. And we've got all of these various Old Testament type things in here to show that Luke is not suggesting, well, when Jesus is born, everything else that came before is irrelevant. Quite the contrary. He's showing here the continuity, that in fact, all of the hope of Israel was centered on what would happen in the lives of these children. That Luke is inviting us to sit in this moment where all that had been promised was now being said to come to pass in these children. This moment, like we said last time, of pregnant expectation. Very much pregnant because Elizabeth and Mary are pregnant with children, but that the fact that the message has come that these children are going to satisfy all that had been promised. Now, generations earlier certainly had spoken of the promise, and they believed in the promise. They lived and died looking for that promise. And it's not to denigrate their faith or diminish that in any way, but there is a slight difference between trusting that the promise will be fulfilled eventually and that moment of pregnant expectation when you know it has to come soon, right? These children are going to accomplish it. It's going to happen within this generation. It's very different to know, hey, something's coming. And to know, hey, something's coming in a few years. When the, when the time definition comes a little bit more into relief. And you felt this burden. Again, what's the message Psalm 89, Ethan, the Ezraite, cries out, God, we trust that you did what you said you did. We trust what we've heard all these great stories of old. What have you done with the promise you made to David? Where are you? Why haven't you done what you said you were going to do with David? And yes, Zechariah and Elizabeth can come and show him John and say, he's going to prepare the way. And Mary can come to Ethan and say, it's, it's coming to pass here in my womb. But for all Israel, that leads to this, this, this glorious moment of, of pregnant hope and expectation, of, of joy mingled with sadness and pain because they still are oppressed. They're still feeling the weight of all of those things upon them. But relief is in sight. God is fulfilling His promises. And again, this is the basis of the idea of Advent. 
Advent itself is not established in Scripture as you should observe it over a few weeks at the end of November and early December. It is not imposed upon us as some kind of obligation or burden that way. But the fact that Luke extends out this story and welcomes us into that narrative gives us the indication that we need to sit in it and to spend some time with Zechariah and Elizabeth and Mary and to experience the wonder and the joy and the exhilaration of promises that are being fulfilled. And we should do that because we may not be at that point in this story, but we're at our own point in the story of pregnant expectation because we know that God has lived in Jesus and died and was raised again in power, that he ascended and he is now Lord. And we live in light of those promises, but the final promise is yet to be fulfilled. He has not yet returned. The judgment has yet to happen. We have not yet obtained the resurrection of life and the glory that God is going to give to all of those who trust in him. And so we find ourselves in that same pregnant expectation. And we know it's coming soon. We need to be prepared for it. That's the whole message of all of those passages throughout Scripture in the New Testament, talking about the day of judgment, is that you're being prepared for it. We may not say it's coming in 10 years or 20 years or 30 years. It may not be as specific as perhaps what uh, Zechariah, Elizabeth, and Mary can see. But it could happen at any time. And we need to live in that moment of joy mixed with sadness. That we still feel the burden of death and, and the, the pressures of sin and the lament over death. But we know the dawn is breaking. We can see the, 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 the kingdom in its fullness in a glimpse. And we yearn to be able to see face to face. To see it in its fullness. And we live and pray to that end as we continue our part in the story of the people of God as we seek to glorify God in all that we do. When we see here in Zechariah's prophecy, what is Zechariah's prophecy um, accomplishing here? It's a really strange oddity, right? Because you'd think he's going to prophesy about John, he's John's father, but he ends up prophesying much more about the Christ child, the one in Mary's womb. Uh, what's going on here? Well, Zechariah knew who his son was going to be. He heard what the angel said. And he sees it here. He's the one to prepare a way. He is going to prepare the way of the Lord. He's going to be the prophet of the Most High. He had most likely heard of how his wife had cried out that Mary was the mother of her Lord. And would have heard what the angel had said to Mary. And therefore, in his message, we get this beautiful humility. Just like John himself, Zechariah rejoiced that God's purposes are being fulfilled. Zechariah rejoices that God is fulfilling his promises to Abraham and to the fathers. And he's probably very excited that his son has a role to play in that, even if it's not the primary role. For Zechariah, what's really important is that God's purposes are being fulfilled for his people. That's what's really what it's all about. Not necessarily where he is in it. And that's a really important lesson for us. Because can we speak more of others than ourselves? Can we be happy? Can we praise God when His purposes are fulfilled, even when it's not us in the middle of it, and our role might remain minor or on the side? Can we speak more of others and what God is doing through them, and can, being content that God's will is being done? Can we live so that we don't have to center ourselves in the middle of God's drama all the time, and that we rejoice that God's purposes are being fulfilled, whatever role we might have in it, and to celebrate how God's purposes are being fulfilled in others, even if that doesn't magnify ourselves. Far too often we want to make ourselves a hero of our story, and we make ourselves a hero of God's story, and we're not that hero. That's why it's good for us to be like Zechariah, and to praise God that His will is being done, and that He is fulfilling His promises to His people, even if we only have a bit role in that. The way that he tells us that, though, is really jarring, because he says it's already happened. He said, God has visited and redeemed his people. God has raised up a horn of salvation for us. And you're like, wait a second. How is it? It hasn't happened yet. Nothing's happened yet, except that the child has been conceived. And a child has been born. And yet, it's not that nothing has happened, right? Because John has been born. And Jesus is gestating in the womb. 
And so this is sufficient for Zechariah. God is faithful to his promises. God has said, this child, John, will prepare the way. This child in Mary's womb, Jesus, will be the Son of the Most High. And so for Zechariah, it is enough. They will fulfill their purposes. God will be glorified. And he can speak of the deliverance that God has lifted up for his people as if it's already happened. And we do well to understand the same, that God's future purposes can be spoken of in the past tense, because God is faithful to his purposes. If we are convinced that Jesus is the Son of God, that he lived, he died, he raised again in power, he ascended, he is now Lord, then we have every reason to believe that he will come again and judge the living and the dead, and that we will share in the resurrection of life. We can consider it as prophetically accomplished. Has it been accomplished in reality? No. We still suffer from death. The moment is not yet. But we can be so firmly established in our confidence in it that we talk about it as if it already happened. Do we have that kind of faith in God? And do we have confidence in his covenant loyalty and faithfulness that we reckon that what he has promised has already taken place? That's our struggle and trial in faith. Will we maintain that conviction and live as if we know so certainly that judgment is coming that we can speak of it as if it's already happened? That is when we truly trust in God's covenant loyalty because that's what Zechariah's prophecy is really about, man, isn't it? God is rescuing his people. He has proven faithful to his promises. His people will enjoy peace and righteousness and holiness. God is faithful and will deliver his people. Faithful deliverance. And Zechariah is far more right than he can know. Zechariah imagines, perhaps, that, you know, God's going to give his people peace from the Romans. But that's not what God's going to do. God's going to give peace from the evil one who is directing the Romans. He is giving them forgiveness of sins which could not be received or imagined under the covenant between God and Israel. And God is providing in his son the way of righteousness and holiness. Which is a full testimony that even the law could only look at in a shadow. The blessings that we enjoy in Christ are far beyond anything Zechariah could have really imagined. Because now we can obtain relational unity with God. And have peace with God. Because we are in relational unity with him. And therefore strive to be like him because of all the great things he has done for us. And that we are overwhelmed by his love and grace and mercy. And wish nothing more to celebrate in the joy of our God. And to be like him because he loves us and cares for us. This is what we see in First Peter and Colossians and throughout the New Testament. Luke's overarching theme throughout this whole section is very plain in God's covenant loyalty. The people of God had been aching, aching to see the fulfillment of what God had said. They were wondering when it would happen. Not because they wavered in doubt, but because they trusted. They were so certain of their confidence in God that they really didn't understand why it hadn't happened yet. And now it's happening. The message that God is giving us in Jesus the Christ child and John, his way he was born, is God is faithful to his promises. God says it, God will do it in his good time. And as he is loyal to covenant, we are to be loyal to covenant. And we can't just decide everything before Jesus is irrelevant. Because John is very much anchoring Jesus in that great drama and story from before. And that Jesus is not the repudiation of the God of Israel or of everything that came before, but its fulfillment. Its ultimate promise manifest and embodied. And that's powerful. Extremely powerful. And it is our surety and anchor to understand why we need to be loyal to him and to be faithful to him and to pursue holiness and righteousness, to look to him as the light and leave the darkness that we can be guided in our feet in the way of peace. Because everything that Zechariah prophesied was fulfilled in John and in Jesus. God rescued his people. He rescued all, in fact, who would be rescued from their enemies, 
the powers and principalities over this present darkness. And those who believe can obtain relational unity in God and his people and the eternal life that comes from that connection to grow in that holiness and righteousness in the way of peace in God. It is not peace as the world gives, but the peace that surpasses understanding that comes through God in Christ for those who seek relational unity with him. And therefore may we also bless God our Father who has proven faithful to his promises and to be thankful for the Lord Jesus Christ and all he's accomplished for us and to pursue that sanctification in the Spirit to obtain eternal life. Let us go to God in prayer. Father, hallowed be your name. We're so thankful this time, Father, for you and your love and care for us. And we wish to know you as our creator and as the one who displays covenant loyalty. That you have fulfilled all the promises you made to our ancestors in the faith. And that you will be faithful to all that you have promised. We're so thankful for Jesus, Father, and that in Jesus you fulfilled all that you promised to Israel. And we are thankful that we have redemption in his name. We're thankful for that hope of resurrection. We earn, yearn earnestly for that day to come where we will stand with him in the resurrection and in his return. We're thankful for the spirit through which you strengthen us and by which we may come to know your great love and the, the word by which we come to understand these things uh, for one another and, and life and all the beautiful things of the spiritual world and the physical realm. Uh, we're so thankful for all these things. We're mindful, Father, this time that there are many who are in deep distress and pain. We pray that you would heal all who are ill. We pray that you would give comfort to those who are grieving uh, and those who are in distress, that you provide for those who are in deep need. We pray that your justice and righteousness would fill our land and that those in authority would allow us to live in peace and tranquility and would uphold true justice and righteousness. We earnestly pray, Father, that we would always remember that you have proven loyal to us in covenant and that you fulfill your promises. And we pray that we would live accordingly. We pray that you would give us the strength and wisdom to understand that what you have promised is certain and that we must live in our time of that pregnant expectation, uh, understanding that the return of Jesus will come at some time, but it's not yet, and that we live as if you will come at any time in Jesus and that your purses will finally be satisfied and that we live in that joy mixed with pain and we persevere to the end. We pray that we would grow in holiness and in righteousness to glorify and honor you and that you would guide our feet in the ways of peace and that we would walk in the light of your Son and out of the darkness and that you would strengthen and sustain us to do so as we begin our journey in Christ and as we continue for many years that we never allow that story to grow old that we never grow weary in doing well and in pursuing you, and that you would always renew our spirit and our strength to understand the profound depths of the love you have displayed to us in Jesus. Continue to guide and direct us, Father, until we meet again. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're so glad that you've joined us, and we'd love to hear what you have to say. You know, Why would God speak through Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist? And why does everything he say uh, is said as if it's already happened? Love to know what you have to think about that. Uh, if we can be of any service, please reach out to us. I uh, would love for you to subscribe to us where you found us. Uh, if we can be of any service, let us know. And may the Lord bless and keep you until we meet again.